Hey there, my name is Heath Hyatt. So excited to come to you today and just share this time in the Word of God together. Let's start with this very first point, building off of that great opening video we just saw. You see, the answer for this broken world is within us. I love the way that video showed it. Uh, we all keep looking for someone else to help us, for someone else to save us, for someone else to do these things that need to be done, you know, because somebody needs to help us out. But the problem is we we are the ones. It's you and me. It's like the person when you're when you're starting to be you're like a young adult and you're growing up a little bit and you're like, oh man, we need an adult in the room. And then you realize you are the adult in the room. You're the adultiest adult in the room. And it's not very encouraging sometimes. You think, oh man, that's not good. Yeah, that's us. Listen, we are the body of Christ. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. We are going to have to grab up the word of God and put the spirit of God in our lives and walk out into this broken world and realize we are uh, the answer for this broken world. This world's a mess. It's ugly. It's, it's busted up. But we're the ones called to change this world. Now imagine with me, if you could, a church. And this church is filled with people that love God. They have a heart for the things of God. This church is filled with people who hear from God and not just hear God, they obey the Lord. This church is filled with people that pray. These people volunteer. These people are generous. They put their money where their mouth is. These people have a fire burning in their hearts. These people see their mission field as the people that are around them and they are speaking life to them, not not like in a Bible thumping way, but in a very real needed way. That is a church in revival. That's a church on fire. And I, I want to be a part of that church. And I believe God is turning us into that church. He's creating that church within us. We've been in the sermon series called The Church Unleashed. We started it last week with part one out of Acts chapter one. And here this week, we're doing Acts chapter two. It's a famous Bible story we're going to be looking at here today. Last week, we talked about what it takes to, uh, to the prerequisites, like the pre-revival, what takes place before the revival. And this week, we're looking at an actual move of God. What happens inside of us, through us, when a move of God is taking place. Uh, I truly believe that America is ripe for a revival. It is ripe for a move of God. In those darkest moments, those are the times when revival has the ability to break out like never before. And I believe you see the darkness of this world and the heartbreaking situations that we, that we know of all across the world, off the planet. Those situations and, and the lack of people seeing God as the answer, those situations are going to be the thing that just starts the fire. People are going to start to, to look for God, look for, for answers from God, and they're going to find, uh, they're going to find him when they start looking. And it's going to be amazing. And, and I, I and we, right? We want to be a part of it. Last week, we saw how Jesus told these first Christians, 120 of them, he told them, stay in Jerusalem. He rose from the dead. Uh, he had rose. He had risen from the dead, but he ascended into heaven. But his last words, the resurrected Christ's last words to these Christians were, "I'm I'm I'm going to my Father, and I'm and he ascends to heaven." But before he says that, he says, "Listen, stay in Jerusalem, because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit." And and so that they did exactly that. They went back and they went to the upper room, um, and they the kind of the headquarters at the time in Jerusalem. And they began to pray just like Jesus told them to do. And God shows up. They had no idea what was about to take place there. So let's look in the word of God in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 1. And let's see this story for ourselves. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Wow, God shows up. And boy, when he shows up, it was like rushing, mighty, roaring windstorm. Then, verse 3, what looked like tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Now, this was not like actual flame. They didn't set their hair on fire. This is what looked like. They're just trying to explain uh, this supernatural experience in words that people would understand. So, 
these flames come, this, this glowing flames come, and they rest on each of them, verse 4, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And at the time, it's the day of Pentecost, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. It's a special Jewish holiday, so we had all these people that had come to Jerusalem for this holiday. So when they heard the loud noise, they heard this rushing thing. <laughs> Verse six, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages, their mother tongues being spoken by the believers. And they were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee. Okay, these people aren't from my area. They were from all over the world. You know, you wouldn't have known this other language. They wouldn't have, they, they're from Galilee. How do they know my mother tongue from Sudan and from, you know, different parts of Eastern Europe? In verse said eight, they says, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. They were just like, what is this? Now, this all happened on the day of Pentecost. There's a lot of significance to this day, uh, the day that it actually happened on. So what is Pentecost? What does that word even mean? Okay, so let's talk about this. Maybe you heard of a denomination called the Pentecostals, or you've heard of, you know, somewhere along the line, you've heard of this Pentecost or Pentecostal or something like that. Well, here's what this really means. Um, let's start out with this. The, the, the Jewish um, idea of Pentecost and what it was in the Old Testament, okay, before Acts chapter 2. Pentecost is the English word for 50. And what it meant was there were 50 days after the Passover, um, there was 50 days later, was the day of Pentecost, the day of 50. And they had been told uh, by God in the book of Leviticus to have this special holiday. And as, and it was seven after the day after seven weeks. So you have seven times seven weeks, seven days of seven weeks, 49 plus one the next day. So that's why it's, that's why it's called 50. Um, so they would, they had this special festival. Now, um, the English word is Pentecost. The Jewish word, the Hebrew word is Shavuot, Shavuot. And it's literally weeks. So they celebrate the, uh, the celebration of weeks. The word Pentecost means 50. The word Shavuot means weeks. So these Jews were really celebrating two things in this ancient holiday. They were celebrating, what, number one, the feast of the spring harvest. So there would be a, uh, you know, these were agricultural people in ancient times. So they would have, uh, they would bring all their crops together. And uh, because God was so very good to them and they're, they were blessed with this bountiful harvest, they would be giving a portion, the first fruits, a tithe of this, uh, this amount, this crops, they would give it back to the Lord on this special Shavuot, um, this special day. So that was called the first fruits, right? This is an important principle to thank God for all he's given us and, and to give a, a portion of that back. It's why we, in the New Testament, we have the idea of the tithe, right? We take what God's given us, we, what, we, what we've earned, and we take it and we, we thank God for it and we, we set that part aside. So they were also celebrating something else. They were celebrating the time when Moses came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments and God gave his instructions to the Jewish people on how to live. So he comes down with the, the law, the Torah, and the, the, they, he came down and this is what, this is how God says to live. This is the do's and the don'ts of what it means to be a follower of Jehovah. So this Jewish holiday of Shavuot celebrated those two things. But you might ask, okay, why is all of that significant <laughs> to me or to us? Well, this Jewish festival lines up with the life of Christ perfectly. Actually, most of the Jewish festivals do. We see Jesus. He was sacrificed on a special holiday called the Passover. And on that holiday, they would have a sacrifice, a Passover lamb that was sacrificed for the forgiveness of the sins of all the people. And we know Jesus, well, John the Baptist said, Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus was the Passover lamb. When he died on the cross that day, when he gave his blood, he was the Passover lamb not to ever be done again, once and for all, for the forgiveness of all the sins of all mankind, you and I, and everybody before and after, Jesus gave his life. 
Now, that's why this, the uh, Passover was important, and we see Jesus' death line up with the Passover, but then we see on the day of Pentecost, this special Jewish celebration, we see the Holy Spirit comes down in tongues of fire, and we see um, the first Christians being uh, started at that place. So the Holy Spirit comes down, and these very first Christians are there. There's 120 that begin this thing, right? This, but this was, if you think about it, this was the first part of the harvest. Now, there are billions of Christians. Over the last 2,000 years, there have been billions of us. You know, and so this started out with 120, this, this one little uh, group, you know, and it's now, that was the first fruits of what has become an incredible, incredible harvest um, for, for of, of believers in Christ. Now, that was also the time, remember, they celebrated where the law came down in Shavuot, where the Torah came down. And that's important, too, because 600 years before Pentecost, so 2,600 years ago, the prophet Jeremiah had a prophecy, had something from the Lord, and God told him in Jeremiah 31, I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. Okay, what does this mean? No longer are we going to have a tablet with the Torah, with the written things of what to do and what not to do. No, God now, we're celebrating Pentecost because not that the Torah came down, the word of God came down in a tablet form. The word of God now lives within us. Man, that's awesome. So we don't need a list of rules and do's and don'ts. God tells us, no, you ought not do that. No, that's not how you should go. He's written it on our hearts. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it was no longer being on stone tablets of what to do and not to do. It was written on us. He's leading us. He's guiding us from the inside out. So Acts chapter 2 was the beginning of this move of God, right? But let's look at what a move of God really looks like, what it really does. First off, a move of God burns stuff out of us. It was tongues of fire that came down. A real move of God changes us. We open our hearts to God, and he does those things inside of us. This is not us being better people. This is not even us honestly making changes in ourselves. It's not what this is. This is us opening our hearts to God and God burning out everything that needs burnt out of us. Now, do you know how silver is refined? Okay, it's a really great process. So of course, they take the ore, and they mine the ore, and they've got this rock with the silver inside of it. And they begin to burn this rock to get the, the rock part burned out of the silver part. And as they're, as they're burning this out, it's, it's several processes of burning out, burning out, burning this out. These impurities rise to the top and they're skimmed off the top. It's burned again and they're skimmed off the top. And every time this process happens, uh, more rock is removed and more ore is, is refined, right? And that silversmith, has to sit in front of this fire for, for quite a while because if you don't watch this process and, and stay vigilant in the process, the whole thing will be ruined. So the timing is very critical. And how does that silversmith know that, the, that it's ready, that you now have pure silver, not some mixture? How does that silversmith know? He knows or she knows when you can see your face in the molten silver, when it's reflective. You see, tongues of fire came on the day of Pentecost, and that represents the Holy Spirit burning the things out of us that need to be burned out of us. It's burning away these undesirable elements, and it happens over and over again. This is not just a one-time thing. This burning of the Holy Spirit out of us is is, is part of the process of becoming a disciple, a process that God is vigilantly overseeing in our lives. He's right there watching over this process. And what is the result of this fire from God? Well, guys, the result is reflection. People can see Jesus through us, that when they see us, they see the Lord, they see Jesus moving. See, God wants to burn away the sins in our life, the attitudes in our life, uh, the habits, the hang-ups, the addictions, 
He even wants to burn out the desires of the flesh, these earthly desires, and put in the desires of the spirit. And all we have to do is allow God to do this process. He'll do the process. He'll do the work. We just got to let him into our hearts and say, yes, Lord, come in, burn it up. I'm going to stay right here in that molten fire until I am what you want me to be. I'm not jumping up off this altar. I'm staying right there. And I'm gonna real. Uh, I'm gonna stay put in this purifying process. Now, one thing a move of God always does is a move of God will completely change us. In verse 14 of Acts chapter two, Peter stepped forward and shouted to the crowd, "Listen carefully, all of you!" Now, Peter here is filled with the Holy Spirit. Just like the, the, one of those tongues of fire rests on his head. And this was, they were up in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. They were up in this second story, second floor. And people are coming from everywhere because they heard this sound. What is going on? Something, some, something's going on. And so all these people began to gather. And Peter walks out of that building and he begins to preach to them. He steps forward and begins to preach to them in the last part there of Acts chapter 2. And the last time we saw Peter, guys... He was broken and crushed and the resurrected Jesus was restoring him on the sea of, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Just, I mean, he was just a broken guy. Remember, he had denied Jesus and he had just was not the same person he used to be. And now we see Peter, this bold preacher with words that are just clearly not his own words. Peter's this uneducated common fisherman, and now the words of God are just rolling out of his heart and life. Matter of fact, this sermon was so powerful that at the end of Acts chapter 2 here, it says that 3,000 people got saved that day. They went from 120 to 3,000 in one sermon. (laughs) That's so incredible. Now, this is not just for Peter. This is not just for those people that were uh, that were there, those 120 that were there in the upper room that day. No, this is for every, the Bible says, this is for you and your children and all those who were afar, are afar off. This is not just for that group of people to have the Holy Spirit like this. And the Bible says it's not just for their children. So it wasn't just for people 2,000 years ago. It was all those who are afar off. That's you and me, guys. We, we just happen to be thousands of miles and 2,000 years later, but this is still for us. And the Holy Spirit is going to completely change us. What's he going to change us into? He's going to change us into witnesses. You know, if you've got a court, uh, you, you have a witness in a court, right? Maybe there was a, some kind of felony or, I don't know, a murder or something. And the witness said, I saw so-and-so, I saw the murder. I, I can attest to that this is what happened. That's what a witness is. And God's called us to be witnesses. We're called to testify to other people about what we have seen, specifically about what God's done inside of us. You know, we can say, I was once this way, and now with the help of God, I'm no longer that way. I once used to think like this. I once used to act like this. And, and I still do from time to time, but God is changing me. This refining process, we're testifying to what God has done and is doing in our lives. That we think differently, we act differently, we react differently, we forgive people. We've gotten forgiveness and we're giving forgiveness. And now like Peter, okay, God started giving him the words and he just opened his mouth and he just started to speak. Listen, this, this testifying stuff, don't be nervous about it. Don't be afraid about it. God is going to give you the exact words that you need to hear, that you need to say. He's going to be speaking through you. The Holy Spirit's going to take over. It's an awesome time. If you've ever had that happen, you're just thinking to yourself, that is so cool. I can't believe that I am saying these things. The Holy Spirit's going to take over just like he did for Peter on the day of Pentecost. Now, one thing you always see with a legitimate move of God is a move of God always puts the word of God in a way that people understand. Now, as soon as they received the filling of the Holy Spirit, they started to speak in tongues, right? The people on the street were from all over the world, and they heard these people testifying in their native languages. So God made sure 
that everyone there was understanding the message of Jesus. They were, these people didn't know. I mean, it was, it was a supernatural thing that was taking place here. These people didn't know those languages. They were just speaking and, and, and out, out of their mouth was coming a language that they didn't even know. But those people heard it in these mother tongues. Now, remember, remember how we talked about that Jewish festival, uh, Shavuot? Okay, the, 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 the festival of Pentecost, uh, Shavuot in Hebrew, Pentecost in English. Well, they were celebrating the coming of the law of God, right? Moses coming down the mountain with the Torah, the law of God. Well, this ties exactly into this idea right here, guys. Um, the, this Jewish story says, uh, and it's called from the Midrash, it's from this Jewish commentary. It says that when Moses did come down the mountain with, this, with the law, that as he began to speak, everybody, men, women, kids, everybody heard the law of God in a way that they could understand. It was put on their level so that they could understand it. And that's one thing I love about God. I love about the message that God's given us, the message of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins that comes from him. You know, this message, it's powerful because you could be uh, someone in, uh, I don't know, the jungles of Africa that no one's ever seen before or on some deserted island, some tribe on some deserted island, or, uh, or you could be, uh, who knows, somebody from the Midwest or somebody that lives on Wall Street. All of those people, this message relates to all of them. And it's related to them 2,000 years ago, and it relates to them right now, too. It just continues to relate and relate. That's just awesome how God does that. And one thing you'll always see about a move of God is it puts the word of God in a way that everybody can grab a hold of. It takes the simplicity of the message, and it puts it in the hearts of the people. See, revival starts when we just take a simple message. You're loved by God. You can be forgiven. You don't have to live this way. Jesus loves you. He likes you. He's for you. And we put, and he died on the cross for you. And you can and you just walk in it. And it's that simple. We take that simple message and we put that in the heart of somebody else. And that is what a move of God looks like. Now, when it comes to a true move of God, there is no in people or out people to a move of God. You see this poor little banana here, right? He's on the outside looking in. Poor little guy. Real moves of God don't exclude people. You know, here we see everyone from all over the world was hearing the message of, of forgiveness and who Jesus was, and they were hearing it in their own tongues. That's God's way of showing that there's no people over here and people over there, that he loves this group, but he doesn't love that group. He loves these kind of people, but that, not that kind of people. No, it was showing that God loves everybody, that God is for them. That God loves men and women and Jews and Gentiles and high class, low class, people that have money, people that have no money. I mean, he loves everybody. This message is for all of us, and he does not exclude anybody. And a true move of God never excludes anybody. And we, we got to make sure we don't do that as well, because it seems like in our society right now, there is a, there is a, a I don't know, people are trying hard to divide us. And divide us along, oh, I don't know, income and class and race and gender and politics and political parties and nationalities and all that. Just separate everybody in these little groups. No, that's never what God is about. God is about bringing everybody from all these different uh, places up underneath him. We see that even in the book of Revelation chapter 6. All the people of God from every tribe and nationality, they were all brought to heaven. Man, why? Because they all just said yes to Jesus. And when we all say yes to Jesus, uh, it doesn't matter what those other things are. You are in the in group. You're all not on the outside. You're on the inside. We have God now in common. We have Jesus now in common. And that's more than enough. But if you notice, some people try to say, though, those people don't, those people are outside. Those A real move of God never does that. It actually unites people under the cross of Jesus. Now, even though we have the same Holy Spirit, God does not make carbon copies. The Holy Spirit works differently in every one of us. He's not making clones. He's not making carbon copies. Uh, it was strange what happened in, in Acts chapter 2. It's, that's kind of weird, okay? These people are speaking in tongues. 
But don't let the strangeness of what happened knock us off of what God is trying to accomplish. And then this goes for us even now. Listen, the work of the Holy Spirit is sometimes really strange. And the way he does things is not the way that we would normally have them done or what we would even think about doing them. And here, guys, honestly, this kind of stuff bothers me. I, I actually am the kind of person that loves when everything is kind of the same. This is kind of like chop, chop, chop. Some part of me really likes that. <laughs> but that's not what a move of God is like. It's chaotic and it's messy and it's not everything fits perfectly into the little boxes all the time. No, moves of God are messy and chaotic. The first one was in Acts chapter 2 and we have seen historically that all the other ones have been kind of messy as well. And so that's just kind of how God works. Very rarely does God do that in this some clean and precise way. No, he's overturning the apple cart. So we need to let God be God. Let's let God do what he does. Let him work differently in different people. Let him move differently amongst different parts of the church. Whatever he chooses to do, let's be okay with it, even if it's different, even if it's different in our lives. Maybe God wants to do something kind of strange in you. And you've maybe been resisting it, like, I don't know, that can't be God. Hey, take a step. You never know. As long as it's in line with the Bible and the truth of the Bible, that step might be something that, that God wants to use you in a very unique way, and he wants to do something through you in a unique way. But we got to let God out of that box. Not try to clone or carbon copy everything. Instead, the Holy Spirit, let's let him lead you. And, and we can follow his, his leading. And I think about Church of the Heartland even. It was used to be called, it was first started in 1987 by my parents, Herb and Sandy Hyatt. In 1987, it was called uh, Grace Community Church. And we had a good time. We were in downtown Winnemac. God was doing some great things down there. Then God spoke to my father to start five churches in five years. Five churches in five years, that's, that's wild. And so that was, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. And you know what? We actually didn't do it the right way. We did it pretty much the opposite way of the way it should be done, really. We started these churches. They had different names and there was a, you know, they were in different locations, of course. And then, and then we were like, oh, that's, we need to work together better. So in 2005, 18 years later, we rebrand everything and we call it Church of the Heartland. And then we had to, now we're doing the same sermon series and we had to make a lot of adjustments and a lot of changes. And so we kind of went about it the wrong way. But you know what? I don't think it was the wrong way. You know, uh, maybe we went about it in a weird way, but that just seems to be how the Holy Spirit works. It's usually not the A plus B equals C type stuff. It's kind of messy. It's kind of backwards. But God takes those things when our heart is pure. God takes those things. And in his timing, he, he does what he needs to do. So, yes, it's been messy at times. But this is God's church. This is his church. This is my church. This is God's church. And all of us, from the pastors on down to the people, just want our church to be exactly what God wants it to be. It's walking out that exact thing. So how can you apply this to your life? You can open your heart to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just open up our hearts. Now, I believe God still fills people with the Holy Spirit now. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus says, Your heavenly Father gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So what are we going to do right now? We are going to ask Jesus to give us the Holy Spirit. We're going to simply ask. I believe God wants to start a move of God, and he wants us to start in us. But first, we have to open our hearts and let God be God and, and ask Jesus to give us the Holy Spirit. So let's do that right now. If we could, let's, let's spend a time in prayer here. Jesus, we pray right now, and we ask right now, Father, send the Holy Spirit right now over our lives into our hearts. Write your word on our hearts, Lord. Put that tongues of fire over our heart. Burn out everything that needs to be burned out. Put in everything that needs to be put in. Jesus, we want a move of God to start with that tongue of fire over our life right now. 
We want it, Lord. We ask, Lord. And then lead us and guide us, Holy Spirit. Show us what to do and what not to do. Tear some things out of us and put some things into us. And Lord, change us into that bold witness that only you can make us. Start a move of God. Jesus, start a move of God and start it within us. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.